Hey, good morning, everyone. If you're watching this in the morning live with us, I hope you're having a great week so far. Um, let's go ahead and start with our standard preamble. Let me make sure that you can see and hear me okay. Um, I did not test the microphone before starting this up, and so I'm kind of hoping it's it's coming through all right. So let me know if you can see and hear me fine. All right, Jeremy and Jason says, I'm good. All right, fantastic. Hey, so kind of an interesting uh, little lecture today. Um, hey, Ryan, fantastic. All right. Um, so just a little bit of uh, backstory. Hey, Jaime and Vanessa, Mason, welcome. Glad you can join us. Uh, so years ago, when I started teaching this particular course, it had a textbook. So all the readings that uh, we've been going through and so forth were all in a textbook, and students had to buy that textbook, and we said, well, screw that. So we went ahead and took the course OER. Uh, OER meaning no textbook. All the readings are free. They're online. They're good for you there. Anyway, so I'm first teaching this class, and I'm going through this textbook, and my wife looks at me one time and says, oh, what book is that? And I explained to her, oh, well, this is on the foundations of business thought. We go way back to Aristotle and Plato, and we look at these readings, and we explore where these business principles first took place. And, and it's all kinds of readings going way, way back in ancient history and so forth. And my wife, who's an infinitely intelligent woman and works in the medical industry and is finishing up her master's. It's just not her wheelhouse, though. And she looks at me and says, oh, that sounds like a special kind of hell. And so for the last, you know, five, six, seven years, she always refers to this and we both refer to it to it as the special hell class, not because it's really all that bad. Right. Right, Aaron. But just because that's how she first came about understanding it. So in any case, I'm driving her into work today. She's getting out, putting on her ID and so forth. She works at the University of Utah Hospital in radiology. And um, and she says, so are you teaching your special health class today? And I said, yeah, actually, today we get to talk about Vikings and kind of the inception of syndicates and trusts and corporations. And she says, actually, that sounds kind of interesting. And I'm like, it is. It really is interesting. So that was a long way of saying that today's lecture has my wife's stamp of approval which is saying a lot because, like I say, she doesn't do business. She does medicine. OK, um, rocking my mind about Aristotle and Plato actually hurt. So I get it. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, I totally get it. Right. Um, hey, Hayden. Good morning. This this isn't easy, but come on. I mean, all right. I totally know that I'm geeking out. I totally know that I'm geeking out, but I love looking at these ideas. I love exploring things that we kind of live in every day without really thinking about it deeply and looking at it in a new way and exploring questions that we've never even thought to ask before. I really enjoy that. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank, yeah, Jeremy. Yeah. We'll see um, why I enjoy this course. I appreciate that. Okay. So. Let's go ahead and get started, right? We're going to talk about early experiments in trusts. Now, th the reading is by Thorstein Veblen. Now, just, just so you know, coming up, this is a good reading by Veblen. I'm just going to give it good. Later on, we're going to do a reading by Veblen that is his seminal work. It is what he made his name with, what he hangs his hat on. So while this is a good and interesting and fascinating reading of Veblen's, um, when Veblen starts to talk about pecuniary emulation and conspicuous conception, that's where it gets really, really exciting. Nevertheless, we're going to go ahead and talk about Vikings today. Now, here's the thing. We all know Vikings. 
and we know what to expect with Vikings. For the most part, and I'm going to pull up my uh, marker here. Um, that's not a marker. This one is the marker. We think about this. We think about warriors. We think about hats with horns. They never had horns, by the way. But we think of the marauders, the Vikings, those folks who would just come in and, and decimate and so forth. And um, hey, Timothy, great to have you. And thank goodness we think about that because that gives us Thor and Loki and all the reasons that make life worth living, right? Here's the thing, though. This is just a romanticized conception of the Vikings, a romanticized version. If we were to really, really look at the true history of Vikings, we are talking about pan-European trade. Vikings were traders, and they weren't just traders like we've been talking about. They, they took trading, put it on steroids, and then made it grow up big and strong, and then put it on more steroids. And I'm going to show you what I mean today. Now, remember, just if we kind of do a quick summary of our, of our lectures so far, we talked about the basic idea of trade. Why do we trade? I have a whole bunch of crap. I don't need it all. And you need some of it. You have a whole bunch of crap. You don't need it all. I need a, some of it. So I'll tell you what, what do, why don't we trade? Easy. And this creates value. And then we started to realize, hey, well, you know, some, some people are just naturally better at production because they their homebodies, they stay put. Some peoples are just naturally better at distribution, the nomads. And so without any real planning or anything, um, we have folks who kind of focus on production, folks that focus in distribution. And then we saw these divisions of labor come about because you know what? The more you do something, the better you get. And so you're faster, you're more efficient, your quality goes up, your productivity goes up. So it's just kind of stupidly obvious to say we should all specialize. But then if we're specializing in one thing, that means we can't do everything else. And so we need each other. We need each other's skills and talents and products. And so we create a marketplace where everybody can come together and everybody is bringing their own unique skill and their own unique product. And we're all trading that way. Everybody has what they need. Okay. And by the way, this is pretty sophisticated so far. It's sophisticated enough that we created money so that we could, you know, do all this. Uh, and we had, you know, without relationships and we have laws, rules and regulations so we can do it without relationships. We at this point have a very, very sophisticated economy and marketplace, but we ain't seen nothing yet. This is where the Vikings really come into their own. Um, <laughs> last week, Ryan says, last week I traded a broken snowmobile track I was trying to sell for $50 instead of beer. I love it. Yeah, great barter. Great barter. Good deal, too. So what do I mean by the Vikings? Well, I want you to think about something. And I want you to think about it pretty deeply, right? And by the way, that one of... um. Uh, of, of Ryan, that's a real world example and an awesome comment. Okay. And a reference to past lecture. Very good. Okay. I want you to think about a Christmas tree farm. We're going to put this on our two minute question slide. And I want you to think about what are all the considerations you need to take into account when deciding how to start a Christmas tree farm. Let me be clear, you have no land, you have no Christmas trees, you have money. You have money, but you have no land, no trees, and so forth. What are the things that you need to take into account? Now, remember, all answers are correct. So don't freak out about, oh, what is he looking for? You're going to find out that all your answers are correct, and it'll just give us something to work with, because we're going to use a Christmas tree farm all throughout our examples here, okay? So 
what are some of the things you need to consider? You have no land, you have no trees, you only have money, but you're going to start this farm. All right, let's explore that idea a bit. Holy smoke, you guys are awesome. So first of all, you got us all the way up to the 10 awesome comments, all right? And then we've got, we have 10 contributors easily. This is fantastic. So you know the drill. The drill is 842.10. Okay, 84210. And we have Ryan come in as well. So I'm going to write down 84210. Send me that email. I know that we've hit 10 twice already. Um, and so we're, oh, thank you, Jeremy. Fantastic. Okay, let's look at these. Let's look at these for a moment because you guys are really onto it. Now, as I, as I respond to these, I'm going to say, hey, write this down because you're talking about something that the Vikings really leveraged. And furthermore, we're, we want to learn some, some nomenclature, some terms, right? So Timothy says startup cost, right? Absolutely. Um, startup costs can also oftentimes be sunk cost. We're going to come back to that. But yeah, you got to look at startup cost. But then a few of you, Timothy brought it up, a few of you brought it up, said how long it will take before the trees are ready to sell. This is big, okay? And the Vikings really explored this a great deal we're going to see. The thing about a Christmas tree is it takes five to seven years for a Christmas tree to be viable as a product that you can sell, which means when we talk about startup costs like Timothy brought up, you have to have enough money to buy the land and, and plant things, but then you got to tend this thing for seven freaking years before you make dime one. And trust me, you're not going to make, you're not going to break even on your first harvest, right? Okay, very good. Uh, Jeremy, um, grow over harvesting, transportation, marketing, location, location for selling your product. Hold on to that one, right? You're absolutely right on all of them. But location is a key aspect here. The One of the things about a Christmas tree is that, you know, transportation cost, as you point out, that costs money. So you want to minimize your transportation costs. Well, how do you minimize your transportation costs? You, to the extent possible, put your your growing fields, I don't know, you know, your your wherever you're growing your trees as close to the market as possible. Okay. Very good. Um 
uh, cost for the trees start? Yes. Hayden, how easy, difficult it is for the trees to grow in a particular region. Okay, this is good, Hayden, because, all right, so Jeremy earlier said, hey, location, because, you know, we want to make sure that we minimize per, um, distribution or transportation costs, I should say. Okay, well, all right, but what if the region in which you want to sell the trees is not particularly a great region for growing, right? So this is something else you need to take into account. Uh, Mario, learn from others, from the farms, learn from their mistakes. That's absolutely correct. Jeremy, um, I'm my summer accounting class, revenue, cost, profit. Hey, that comes up as past lecture, right, from other classes. Very good. You got to make sure that you're getting a return on your investment. Um, the tree, the space that the trees take up. Very good, Jason. Here's one of the things about trees is they require a lot of land. They require a lot of space. You need to um, put that into account. So, Ryan, weather to grow them, right, and how much water they will need and so forth. Gr you know, great example of, of how where your market is may not be the best place to grow them. Now, Ryan says, um, go through retailers like Amazon. Everyone, remember Amazon. We're going to use Christmas trees as an example in today's lecture, and we are going to use Amazon as a major example in today's lecture. Because, frankly, this model that Amazon has set up, the Vikings set up first. It is almost, and I'm not just, well, to some degree it is hyperbole, but Amazon is using the playbook of the Vikings. It's extraordinary. Okay, um, let's see, Hayden said, Jeremy, we've talked about the same thing in the math class, another real world and connecting, very good. Yes, and I'm going to give that one too because you talked about the same thing and you're citing somebody else's comment. Good work. Um, Aaron, uh, where the trees will grow in low maintenance way. I like that, low maintenance, right? Very good. Um, and then, you know, where you're planning on selling them. Um, yes, yes, the math class, it's going to come up there a lot. Very good. So let's come back to our... Yeah, we've got lots of yays. Um, okay, let's turn that off for the moment. All right, so now what we're going to do is you've got in your mind this Christmas tree farm, and you guys clearly understand that you don't just wake up one day and start a Christmas tree farm. It is going to take years and years of investment and research and marketing and experimentation and failure over and over and over before you can make one dime. So how do you do this? Well, the Vikings kind of introduced several ideas. The first idea that the Vikings introduced is the syndicate. Now, Yes, syndicates are often associated with illegal ventures like a drug syndicate or something like that, or controlling, monopolizing. Um, and in many ways, syndicates are illegal. So, for example, OPEC. OPEC is a syndicate and is technically illegal, but we deal with it because you can do whatever you want. Well, not whatever you want. They have different laws, rules, and regulations in the Middle East. There, a syndicate is just fine. Technically, if the OPEC members were to have a meeting here in the U.S., we would all arrest them because it's a syndicate. Nevertheless, um, the principle, though, of a syndicate actually still holds water quite well. Um, so, Let's read what the reading says, but then let's explore the idea. We're going to do a lot of reading from the reading. Kind of meta. Um, so, the early combinations. Now, combination is fancy speak for an arrangement, an agreement, a, a partnership, if you will. Okay? So, the early combinations were relatively small and transient. Transient means... We make the agreement when we need it, and then when we no longer need it, the agreement is ended. It's They're super, super, super short, 
okay? Um, I'll give you a real world example as soon as we get through that has to do with Christmas trees. They took form of gentlemen's agreements, you know, pools, working arrangements, division of territory, rather than hard and fast syndicates. So these were just really temporary gentlemen's agreements that we only put on. Um, let's see, uh, professor comment on what it's, you know, put it. Yes, we will. We will. Um, these are really temporary um, agreements, gentlemen's agreements that are put in place just to meet an immediate need. And then when that need disappears, if it, it, the, the agreement is no longer there. So, for example, um, we used to buy our Christmas tree from this lot down the street, and every single year they're in the same parking lot, okay? Um, and you've seen them when you're driving along, brum, 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 brum. You see these Christmas tree lots all over the place selling Christmas trees, and they're in parking lots. Well, now there's no hard and fast, you know, long-term contract for those parking lots and so on and so forth. It's a transient agreement. Every year, the Christmas tree seller will go to this place and say, hey, you know, we'd like to go ahead and rent out your parking lot again. And the folks say, you bet, let's, let's work up an agreement. They do it, take care of it, and then it's done, okay? So that's the sort of thing we're looking at. Now, these are small, right? These were not hard and fast syndicates, as we say. Let's keep exploring this. In those days, a combine, an agreement, would be formed for season between two or more capitalist undertakers. A season, like a Christmas season between two or more capitalist undertakers, like the folks who are building the, who are building, who are growing the Christmas trees, the folks who are selling the Christmas trees, and the folks who own the parking lot. Three people have an agreement temporarily for a season, such as a Christmas season. Uh, for the most part, employing, you know, their own capital, everybody kind of brings their own money to the table, not a big deal. There's no real credit or anything going on. You know, it's just, you know, simple little things. Now, remember here, syndicates, when organizations work together to conduct some type of business in order to promote their collective interests, okay? Um, let's see. So, uh, Timothy says, a lot of time right before the end of the season, they abandon the Christmas trees and put a sign on them for free. Totally transient. Yes, real world example, right? Um by the way, hey, so I'm just, I'm sorry, but I have to tell you this story. I have to tell you this story um, to show supply and demand, right? So um, I'm living in California. My, my family is very young. And um, one of my sons is severely mentally handicapped. And so we really can't have a Christmas tree because he tears it apart. I mean, it's it's just, it can't be done, Right. And so we're in California and it's Christmas Eve and we're feeling really bad that we don't have a Christmas tree. We have another son and another, you know, so we have three kids and the middle one is our mentally handicapped. And we just feel like bad parents for not having a Christmas tree on Christmas Eve. And so we say, OK, that's it. We're going to go do it. So we go off to the to the Christmas tree place. Right. And to buy a tree. And now it's Christmas Eve. They have a lot of trees, but they sell it to us for like, and I'm not making this up, three times the normal cost. Because their logic, and it was correct logic, is if you're here on Christmas Eve, you are desperate for a tree. We were. We were going through some emotional family, yada, yada stuff. And we had made the decision we were desperate for a tree. They smelled our desperation. They sold it to us for three times as much. We put the tree up that evening. My son tore it down the next morning. That tree was up for less than 12 hours. But there you go. Good times, good times. All right, so that's a syndicate. All right, Vikings are starting to put together syndicates. These are more or less temporary arrangements um, such that everybody can benefit from it, right? Okay, very good. Um, yeah, it was rough, but you know what? 
funny how it is, Timothy. The things that are bad in the moment make for great memories and great stories. Okay, let's keep going with syndicates. Syndication of an increasingly close texture and more and more permanent start to come up, right? Um, have rapidly grown in favor through the 9th and 10th centuries. We don't care about that. The reason for this movement and coalition are plain, the volume of trade as well as its territorial extension increasingly uninterrupted. Okay, we don't care about dates, we care about reasons. All right, so what's happening is all these little temporary agreements are making money, right? They're bringing in the cheddar, and so they're going, this is kind of awesome. Our money is increasing, our wealth is increasing, our influence is increasing, our power is increasing. And as we're going to learn from the profit motive later on, which you guys already pointed out in a previous lecture, you can never have enough. So these syndicates start to become more and more permanent, right? And, and they start to really grow in extension. Now, it says here, territorial extension. These are the, the Viking longboats. We're going to come back to these longboats in a moment, okay? But the, the Viking longboat was the technological marvel of the day that really made these huge, vast networks, business networks that we're about to see possible. Okay, let's continue. So, then they start to build this thing called a trust, okay? Now, this is what it says in the reading, but then we'll go ahead and um, and do a do a formal definition. Um, they're probably messy, but smells good. <laughs> totally, totally. Okay, the the quasi voluntary coalition of forces known as a trust. All right, let's look at a dictionary definition that you and I can kind of wrap our minds around. A trust is a business organization, a group of businessmen or traders organized for mutual benefit to produce and distribute specific commodities or services, all managed by a central body of trustees. Okay, so for example, let's say that one group says, hey, you know what, we'll take care of all the production. And another group says, all right, we will take care of supplying all the raw materials you need for the production. And another group says, all right, I'll tell you what, we will take care of all the distribution. And another group says, okay, that sounds cool. I'll tell you what, we will take care of security for these distribution routes. These are all individual entities, all right? They're all individual However, they all get together in mutual agreement and, and for mutual bene benefit and say, we are going to do business together. And then one central body says, OK, we will orchestrate it from on high. We will make sure that all these moving parts, the raw materials, the production, the distribution, the security, all that will make sure that all these moving parts are orchestrated efficiently. That's what the central body does. Jeremy, the trust was when they were hoping the Vikings wouldn't raid. Yes. You know, the Vikings did do a lot of raiding in the beginning of their history, the beginning. But then you raid a place and you destroy it, and it's like it's not producing wealth for you anymore. Okay? Then they started to realize we don't need to raid these places. All we have to do is bring them into the trust. By the way, sometimes these trusts as it says here, quasi-voluntary. Sometimes the, the Vikings would show up and say, hey, you remember like 10 years ago, we would just come by every season and raid you guys. And folks would be like, yeah, that totally sucked. Yeah, well, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. However, what we are going to do is you are now a producer of wheat. In your whole region, you're going to produce wheat and you're going to be a member of this trust. We're not going to raid you anymore, but we are going to decide what you're going to do. You're going to produce wheat and you're going to supply that to the trust and you're going to get a cut from it. And folks would be kind of like, uh, well, I guess if it's between that and raiding, yeah, we'll join the trust. Right. Yes. Very much an OPEC example. Um, 
yeah, by the way, it is mafia, right? That is sort of that that feel, right? Totally. Um, uh, that was a reference to real world. Very good. Okay, so let's so you see, guys, and we're just beginning. This is getting pretty darn sophisticated, right? This is this isn't just trade here and there in marketplaces. Um, this is getting sophisticated. All right, now we've got turnover. Okay, you guys already pointed this one out. Remember how you said, hey, well, you know what? If we're going to build this Christmas tree farm, we've got to think about how long it's going to take before we can start selling it. You're totally right. Now, in the case of the readings, this is going to make, yeah, make them an offer they can't refuse, right? Um, this is period of turnover or period of production, all right? Here's the idea is if it, first of all, period of production, it takes seven, five to seven years to grow a Christmas tree. Well, then you've got turnover. Well, it would be pretty ridiculous to just plant your whole field and then every seven years harvest your whole field and start new every seven years. And so what Christmas tree farms do is just like this picture shows right here. They stagger their crops, right? Every tour, every year, they will plant new crops. So that means that one fifth, 20% of their field, of their land, 20% of their land is harvested and planted each season. So even though you have, say, like a thousand acres, you're only getting 20 and 200 acres worth of trees each year. But that's what it takes. That's your period of turnover. Okay. So the Vikings are really taking this into account. And furthermore, they're figuring out, well, if we have different places all over the world next to rivers, because rivers and oceans and so forth are a distribution channel. If we set up farms all along these rivers and coasts and so forth, then we can have a huge network of product ready to go. Um, now, we also have the idea of sunk cost. That's going to come up in your questions and quizzes and so forth. Sunk cost, here's your definition that I bet you guys have studied in other classes. And then we'll do it from the reading. So first of all, the definition. A cost that has been incurred and which cannot be recovered to any significant degree, significant degree if the business fails. So, for example, if I plant a thousand trees and nobody buys those thousand trees, well, it's like you said earlier. Who was it? Uh, I think it was maybe Mason or somebody said at the end of the season, if nobody buys them, they're abandoned. Yeah, because on... December 27th, a tree is useless. It's pointless, right? Well, they're made into mulch and so on. But the point is, you've lost that cost. That is a sunk cost. You're not getting that money back. And so Vikings are having to kind of build this in, saying there are certain costs that we're just never going to get back if a business venture fails. And a good business venture and so Jeremy was talking about, hey, talk about starting businesses. A good business venture figures out two things. Well, actually, they figure out about 2,000 things. But here are two things that a, a business venture figures out. When will I break even, right? And so how much, you know, how long do I need to be in business before I recoup what I've invested? And if it fails, what are my sunk costs? And so whenever I see people starting businesses, I always like it when they are thinking of a business that takes relatively little upfront cost because then they are minimizing the risk of sunk cost. So, yeah. Now, in the reading, it says, um, for a business venture to get off the ground, a relatively large initial investment must be sunk. Period of turnover, period of production is necessary of some duration, and the risk is considerable because anything can happen to your crop in seven years, my friends. You can get fires, you can get insects, you can get diseases, you can get poachers, you can get 
anything in those seven years. So you have to sink an enormous amount of money into tending it, securing it, all that stuff. And the Vikings are doing this on a massive scale, massive scale. All right. Accumulation of capital goods, right? Produce goods that are chiefly used in production of further goods in contrast, right? B2B. Let me explain what we're talking about here. Yeah, bugs. Oh my gosh, bugs and the trees. I've had plenty of trees taken out by bugs. Um, here's the thing. The Vikings really focused on um B2B goods, products, okay? Now, there's B to C, which is business to customer, right? So when you go off to Walmart or you buy something from a business and you are the end customer, you are the end user of that item that you're buying, you are B to C. You are the C, you are the customer, they are the B, they are the business, they sell it to you. Vikings, though, they are focusing in B to B which is they're not really selling to an end user customer. They're selling mostly to other businesses that will take their materials and use them in production of something else, okay? Um, now, here's the thing. Here's one of the reasons they like to do this. If I sell shoes, the only people I can sell shoes to are people who need shoes. But if I sell rubber that go into making the soles of the shoes, I can sell rubber to anybody who needs rubber. So now all of a sudden I'm selling to shoe producers. I'm selling to tire producers. I'm selling to HVAC producers. I'm selling to everybody who needs rubber. Okay. Same thing with plastic and so forth. So what the Vikings found is that they had a much larger market if they were selling to other producers than if they were selling to end customers. Furthermore, and this is important, it means that their level of power and influence really increased from an economic standpoint because now all of a sudden they were the central, if not the only supplier of goods and services necessary for local economies to stay afloat. So really important. Uh, Jeremy said, products from China, cheaper cost with higher profits. Absolutely, right? Um, because their production is a lot less expensive. And so Vikings in the same way are going to where production is best. Okay, let's keep going. Um, I already talked about why Vikings do B2B, so we're not going to worry about that. Now, let's look at this in terms of Amazon, okay? Um, I want to I want to show you, first of all, let's talk about what, what Vikings have already done that Amazon is doing. So Vikings are, first of all, uh, using a huge distribution channel in their long ships and the rivers and the coasts. Now, Amazon as well has massive distribution, obviously, around the world. Vikings were setting up places of production and warehousing and, and, and refinement and so forth all over Europe so that they had access to all this no matter where they were. Um, yes, yes, they were totally logisticians. Totally, Aaron, you're absolutely right. Amazon as well sets up fulfillment centers all over the world. Now, we have a fulfillment center out at the airport here in Salt Lake City. That is why when you order something on Amazon, if it is a high normal, you know, thing that most people buy, then you can get it within 24 hours. In some cases, you can get it within that same day. It's nuts crazy. Um, that's not by accident. It's because Amazon has set up fulfillment centers all over the world so that they can get the right stuff to the right people as quickly as possible. This is from the Vikings playbook, okay? Um, so now let's read this 
piece about the big picture from the reading again, and let's connect it with Amazon because they're going to be talking Vikings, but everything in here can be said to Amazon. So watch this. For the business venture to be successful, certain technological prerequisites must be met in the way particularly of shipping. Okay, shipping for the for the um, um, Vikings meant ships. Well, for Amazon, it means aircraft. And by the way, Amazon is building its own airline. Okay, so shipping, we're now talking aircraft. Navigation, well, now the Vikings were awesome navigators. Well, thanks to GPS, so is Amazon. The manufacture of weapons. Okay, now what the manufacture of weapons means for the Vikings is security. They've got to protect their distribution routes. They need to protect their fulfillment centers and so forth. Well, now Amazon has to do this as well. Now, in the case of Amazon, they can really rely on a major government and world governments to help ensure security. Um, we're going to touch upon this again in a moment. But, you know, let's think about it. Piracy is not a thing of the past. We still have pirates all over the world and carjackers and people stealing from porches and so forth. In the case of the Vikings, they had to figure out how to provide their own security. In the case of Amazon, they rely on local governments to provide that security. But even those local governments have to make this a continuous, continuous, you know, effort. An accu um, uh, adequate accumulation of capital goods. In other words, they need stuff. They need to build all this stuff. They need to buy all this stuff, all these fulfillment centers. Now, how does Amazon do this? They do it through investment, through stocks and tax um, bonds and so forth. So Amazon sells stocks. They sell bonds to get the capital wealth they need to acquire and build these capital goods. OK, um, Jeremy said um, uh, and Amazon uh, bases their warehouse based their products in that where based on the products that must be. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So what he's saying is. Amazon has these awesome algorithms that has figured out what are the 20% of things that we need to hold in stock in this particular fulfillment center that 80% of the people in that region like to order, right? So they figure out what people in an area like to order. Um, so real world, um, uh, Aaron, there have been recent videos, yes, of Amazon delivery trucks being pirated by looters. It's true. Uh, Vikings had dragons for security. Okay, that's getting uh, past reference to a previous lecture, that one being Train Your Dragons. Um, let's see. Uh, winter is coming. <laughs> yes, it is. Hey, today's the first day of fall, folks. Isn't that awesome? Okay. Um, and then there also has to be a supply of labor. Guys, this is a major, major element the corporations today, uh, you know, take into account when deciding where to build facilities. They need labor. And right now, Amazon is always hiring out at the airport. OK, it's a tough job, by the way. Um, so these are all things that the Vikings needed to be successful and dang, if they aren't the exact same things that a massive corporation like Amazon needs to be effective. So Amazon did not create anything new. The Vikings did this. OK, now let's talk a moment about security, right? Remember I said um, <laughs> Starks. OK, remember I said, OK, the Vikings have to kind of worry about their own security and so forth. And they're Vikings. They can do that. They got Thor on their side. However, um, let today what we're counting on is is basically states, governments, countries and so forth, municipalities to provide that security, which means you need to be in good graces with just about 
all the countries. All right. Um, well, the reading talks about this guy named, named Palnatoki. I think that's how it's pronounced, Palnatoki. And he kind of put together what would be considered the first corporation that was set up in a region such that everybody would support it. So let's just go through the reading to show you what we're talking about. So, you know, as it may often happen, like conjecture, when the irksomeness of this competitive situation in Baltic was fast becoming intolerable, okay, there arose a man of far seeing. Okay, let's, let, let's, let's, what did this whole preamble here say? It means, man, we were killing each other. The Vikings, you were spending so much money on security and and war and so forth to protect your distribution routes, to protect your your crops, to protect your fulfillment centers, your warehouses and your customers. You were just spending so much money on that alone that you weren't making money. So it became intolerable. There arose a man of far-seeing Sadducees and settled principles. In other words, he was smart and moral, smart and ethical, of executive ability and business-like integrity. He was smart, moral, knew his business, and had integrity. Who saw the needs of the hour and the ability, uh, the available remedy, and who saw that um, at the same glance, his own opportunity for gain. All right, what did all that flowery language say? It says, okay, listen, the situation was intolerable. All the, everybody was at war. They were trying to kill each other because they wanted secure, they wanted their, each other's distribution routes, warehouses, land, all that sort of stuff. And this really got, entrepreneur. <laughs> yes, Aaron, right? Um, basically said, hey, I see an opportunity here. I see an opportunity not only to resolve the problem, problem, but to benefit from it in the same way, right? And so um, he says, I'm going to go ahead and solve this. So this is what he did. Paolo Antoki see, um, seems to have cast about for a basis on which to promote an international coalition of Vikings. In other words, all you tribes, all you peoples, all you regions, stop fighting. You're not helping anybody. You're certainly not helping yourself. You think you're helping yourself, but you're not. All you're doing is sinking all your money into this pointless fighting, right? So let's stop competing with, with each other and start kind of working together. Um, now, the thing is, though, to do this, they needed to find a more or less neutral place. Because if you do business in any one area, then that one area kind of benefits more than the areas where you didn't do it. Now, if you watch um, the third Star Trek of the new movies, remember they built that snow globe in space and and McCoy's like, couldn't we have just found a planet to build on? And Spock says, no, we want to maintain neutrality. It would have been seen as favoritism and created tension. Well, that doesn't look tense to you. It looks like a damn snow globe in space. OK, well, it's the same thing. They need more or less a neutral place to do business so that everybody would agree to participate. OK, so he organized the company. Um, there, the company was incorporated under a special franchise from the Wendish Crown with the stipulation that it was to do business only outside of its territories. So, yeah, Death Star. Um, here's the idea. It's like, OK, listen, you can set up your corporation here, but you can't do business here because you would compete with all of our local businesses. And so that way they could maintain the balance. Together with ships and other equipment, the tangible assets, um, Vikings were admitted to a fellowship. Um, it's, um, let's say, franchise goodwill, let's say, promote underlying companies. 
Its bylaws were very strict, both as to the discipline of personnel as well as to the distribution of earnings. So you get this corporation together, you and and you're in. It's no longer these transient trusts or syndicates or anything like that. You're in. You belong to the corporation. The corporation is a separate entity. But because of this, we have in place very, very strict rules about how we do business, how monies are are distributed among the members and so forth. Um, We have powers to enforce the bylaws and so on. And so lo and behold, you have the very first major corporation. Now, um, yeah, we're not going to worry about that one. Okay. But now, and this is where we're gonna where we're gonna finish up. You have your first corporation, great, fantastic. Pal Natoki was awesome. He was great. He was wise, and so on and so forth. Well, now, why do corporations fail? Well, it's interesting. They fail today for the same reason that these corporations failed. So, Pal Natoki was awesome, smart. Wise, insightful, moral, ethical, prudent, sagacious, all that good stuff. Along comes Sigvaldi, who is an idiot. The trust, moreover, okay, the company, being supreme within its field, um, the discipline grew last and it's extended exactions grew arbitrary, sometimes going to unprovoked um, excess. Let me explain what that means, okay? The trust, be, moreover, being supreme within its field. We are the biggest, the best. Nobody can touch us. We are the bomb. And we get kind of full of ourselves, right? That, you know, there's a reason why when you want to search something, you Google it, you don't Yahoo it, okay? Uh, there's a reason why when you want to see what your grandmother is doing, you go to Facebook, you don't go to MySpace. Um, there's a reason why the phone you're holding is an Apple or a Samsung. It is not a BlackBerry, okay? Um, although Jeremy may still have a BlackBerry. The point is, corporations get to where they think, you know, can't touch this. We're so big. So that's the first problem that happened. Discipline grew lax. They were spending money left and right. Um, Things became arbitrary, unprovoked, excesses, meaning, yeah, too big to fail. Right, exactly, Aaron. Meaning that uh, unprovoked excesses, um, they... um, just spent money on the stupidest damn things that they didn't need, right? Um, uh, let's see, Timothy C. said earlier, you did de- declare bankruptcy to make money by choosing the business and reopening as a new business, right? That's actually a way you can do it. Um, as And so going on, as one might say, too little thought was given to the economies of production And the charges were um, pushed beyond what traffic would bear. Let me explain what that means in modern economic speak. It means you did not pay sufficient attention to your production. They were not efficient. You did not look at what the market could bear and what the market was willing to spend and how much of a market there were for your goods. You just kept producing the crap. You did not produce it efficiently, and so you were trying to sell it too expensively to recoup your costs. And when you try to sell too much, too expensive, you fail. It's really simple. And so I find it really, really, really fascinating that um, the things that we were doing back in the days of the Vikings are the very same things we're doing today. We like to think we're uber modern, genius, amazing, you know, uh, incomparable business people. And we come up with these really, really, really good ideas. 
But the fact of the matter is there's just no good, there's no new idea. It is an existing idea applied to a new age and a new need and a new set of circumstances. And that's exactly what we see here today. Um, yes, profit to fix the business. So I like this quote from Neil Gaiman, Gaiman, Neil Gaiman. Can you believe it? 50 miles from a McDonald's. I didn't think there was anywhere in the world that was 50 miles from a McDonald's. McDonald's is everywhere, and they followed the very same model. And by the way, they do follow the very same model, where they grow their wheat, where they grow their beef, where they source their materials and so forth. Yeah, totally. Okay. So lo and behold, guys, there we are absolutely tremendous. I think this is, I mean, every time I say how frankly impressive you are at, for being so engaged in this process, and I swear every time we get up to our numbers faster and we get bigger numbers each and every time. So absolutely great work. Um, with all of that, what I would like to do is I am going to, this is the lecture done. So if you're here for the lecture, either um, watching it uh, live or watching it afterwards, um, the lecture is all set. I am now going to take a moment to speak directly to my students to talk about what to focus on in terms of the reading for Thursday's lecture. OK, so with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up and I'm sorry, I should have had this before. All right, we are going to bring up, should have had this already set up. Oh, don't make me do the duo because my phone's in the other room. Yay! Okay, so let's come back over here. So this is where we are. I'm gonna come over to our modules. And you notice here we are, we just did early experimentation and trusts. So that means our next one is a social organism by Tawny. All right. Now, this is what this one, this particular lecture is going to mark a, a kind of end point of a certain idea. And the next week we go into a new set of ideas. This one really talks about what is the conflict between business and religion. We've already talked at some length about the conflict between business and religion thus far. Aristotle, I mean, yeah, Aristotle and Plato didn't like it because, oh, it's going to create greed. Money isn't real. You should focus on things of the spirit. You could really see how business which kind of represents greed and avarice and so forth, um, wouldn't play well with religion. Well, what we're going to do in this particular reading and lecture is we are going to look at the ways in which business and religion did not really come together. They, they were at loggerheads. Now, just a peek ahead. When we meet again next week, we're going to see how that flips and how business and religion love each other. And they still do love each other. We're going to talk about what happened to make that change. But right now, we're looking at old world thinking. So what I want you to really focus on um, is this one is mega. Attitudes of religion toward economics. You absolutely want to read that section. OK, it will give you a lot of insight into the principles that we discuss in Thursday's lecture. Um, as we go on, um, let's see. Doctrine of economic ethics. You absolutely want to read this section. Doctrine of economic ethics right there. And. Um, scan through the other sections just scan okay make sure that you understand kind of the main terms and the ideas they're talking about but when it comes to reading in detail doctrine of economic ethics and then attitudes of religion toward economics 
those you want to read in, in detail. The others you can just scan to make sure you understand the terms they're using. If you do that, you are going to be in fantastic shape, okay? Um, so, uh, by the way, uh, Jeremy says, even religion needs capital to grow in their congregation. Oh, it's so true. We're going to see some really interesting shifts next week. Really interesting, okay? So with that, everyone, fantastic work today. Thank you for your engagement and your participation. Uh, as per usual, I'll stick around in the comments just a little bit to make sure if you have any questions or any clarification I can offer. Otherwise, we are all set. Have a fantastic day, and we will see you on Thursday. Thanks a lot.